Okay, managing pond habitat for wild turkeys. Uh, here are a couple of the, the uh, uh, topics I'm going to focus on uh, today. I think you've heard Patrick mention uh, most of this already, but uh, uh, but uh, a cu couple of the basic habitat requirements: of turkeys, nesting, brewery and habitat. Uh, I mean, there are other habitat requirements like roosting and foraging and things like that. But nesting and brood rearing habitat seems to be the most significant limiting factor that I run into uh, in pine forest uh, uh, with regard to turkeys. And so I'll focus my talk on how to establish and maintain the nesting and brood rearing habitat and what management practices we can employ to, uh, to, to keep those. Uh, again, I'm, I'm just going to repeat basically what Patrick just said. It's worth repeating, actually, I think. But uh, but what is the nesting habitat? We have to. Uh, I'm going to try to describe uh, what that is and illustrate that with some slides a little bit later. But, but nesting habitat for wild turkey is basically uh, very dense, herbaceous ground cover that's um, uh, roughly two to three feet tall. It can vary if it's predominantly grasses. It may be taller than that. If it's uh, predominantly herbaceous or weedy, it may be much lower than, uh, or, or around that two to three you know, feet tall. But dense herbaceous ground cover, two to three feet tall with some woody shrubby cover mixed in with that. Um, why, why is that important? Um, um, well, that hen is spending a lot of time on the ground. Um, um, and, sh and, and so there's uh, a lot can happen to her during that time that she's laying eggs and, and incubating eggs. So that dense herbaceous ground cover makes a woody shrubby cover, helps conceal that hen both laterally and, and over the top. Um, so it, uh, it will impede uh, nest searches by both aerial and terrestrial predators. That's very important. And also for thermal regulation too. That hen is sitting out there on the ground for a long time during the summer months, she doesn't want to be beamed with, with sun all day long. So it just provides a shading effect. And as, as, as Patrick mentioned, the proximity to of nesting habitat to brood habitat is very, seems to be uh, very important. That, that, that tends to show up in most all habitat related research projects with turkeys. Um, I think what you'll probably see is that most turkey nests will be within about 100 feet or less of, of adequate brood habitat. Some, some more, but, but I think most of them will be located within about 100 feet. Here's a loblolly pine stand not too far from here. Um, uh, as you can see, uh, this, this stand has been thinned a couple of times. This is actually a natural loblolly pine stand. Uh, you've got an open canopy. See the open canopy, got a lot of sunlight reaching the forest floor, uh, allowing that uh, ground cover to, to develop. Um, if we, uh, a little closer look at that ground cover, uh, you see very, very dense herbaceous ground cover mixed with some woody shrubby stuff. This is primarily sweet gum, but that's fine. But, uh, when I went into this pine stand to take a picture, this hen, you see that hen here? She actually had a nest right in there. So it was really, really uh, perfect timing. Um, again, open pine canopy, a lot of sunlight getting to the forest floor. You can kind of see the dense herbaceous mixed with, with woody shrubby cover. There's a closer look. Brewberry habitat. Um, it is a little different than nesting habitat. It's characterized as a low growing herbaceous <coughs> ground cover. Um, as Patrick described, um, uh, the, the, the uh, vegetation <coughs> has to be uh, um, open enough on the, on, on the ground to allow uh, movement of those turkey pulse so that they can forage efficiently. If a turkey pole, if, if, if you got a lot of thatch on the ground, the insect community may be there. 
But if that little turkey chick is, is, is struggling to, to secure an insect, then energy expenditure outweighs energy intake, and so uh, mortality would certainly increase uh, if that's the case. So having that bare ground so that the turkey chicks can forage efficiently, but also have the, the vegetation needs to be dense enough or high enough so that it provides an overhead protective canopy for those chicks, but not so high that the hen can't see over. So you've got vegetation growing kind of low that the chicks can forage underneath. The hen can see over the vegetation to keep an eye out for predators. Uh, brood habitat does change slightly over time. Um, uh, uh, hens with, with chicks that are less than uh, two weeks old post, post hatch hit the favorite areas that uh, have a little more woody or shrubby cover. Um, as the chicks grow old, uh, get older, and they, and they develop further, they tend to leave those areas and move into more open habitat like pasture. <coughs> Um, this shot's on that same property I showed you a few slides earlier. Um, you, you, this is really good brood habitat here. Uh, low growing vegetation, a lot of bare ground here. Chicks can forage very efficient in this type of uh, plant structure, but it's tall enough so the chicks can um, uh, forage beneath that canopy, but it's not so tall that the hen can't see over it. This, this is a actually a beetle spot right here. So how do we create and maintain those critical nesting and root habitats? Well, in the southern pine forest, uh, thinning, uh, of course, is, is critical. Um, uh, now, how much we thin really depends on what your objectives are. Um, uh, if, if, if economics generating revenue from the pine stand is your priority, you may not thin as heavily as you would if turkey habitat is your priority. So I really can't stand here today and tell you, and give you an exact number on how, uh, how much to thin. The best answer is it depends. But if turkey habitat mm -hmm. is driving decisions here, then you want to open the pine canopy up enough to allow enough sunlight in so that the ground cover can develop into those plant communities that you need for, uh, or turkeys need for nesting and brood rearing. And, and also, uh, uh, as that new vegetation is developing, it produces a lot of forage for our juvenile turkeys, adult turkeys, like soft mass, dewberries, blackberries, blueberries, etc. cetera, uh, seed producing plants, insects, succulent vegetation. So thinning is, is, is critical. Once we thin our pine stands and the vegetation, the ground cover is intact, the best way to maintain that is with prescribed fire. Fire is the most, without doubt, the most efficient uh, tool we have in, in maintaining large areas uh, for turkeys and the most cost effective, too. It's important because it sets back plant succession. If we exclude fire from a pine stand, then it goes off on a different uh, type of trajectory. Uh, and develops into a, a usually a mixed hardwood pine stand, which may be good for adult turkeys, but it, we're not going to produce any turkeys in, in that kind of uh, far structure. So it sets back to plant succession, maintains the ground cover in that diverse weedy, grassy, woody cover that we need for nesting and, and brood rearing. Minimizes uh, wood invasion. Um, <coughs> Uh, I was working in South Alabama these uh, last two days, and I looked at a lot of pine acres. All of them are, the common problem that I saw with all of those that I looked at was woody invasion, either because of fire exclusion or um, fire frequency wasn't adequate to maintain the, pro the, the proper ground cover. That's a big problem we have in our southern pine forest today is woody, woody encroachment. Uh, frequent fires can help deal with that woody encroachment and minimize it. Uh, fire promotes food production. The best tool we have for growing insects. If you want to produce and grow turkeys and recruit turkeys into you, your, your hunting population, you got to know how to grow insects. So to some degree, we've got to be, we, we got to be insect farmers, if you will. 
fire is a great tool for growing those kind of plant communities that insects rely on for food. And uh, of course we get a lot of soft mass seed producing plants and, and suck the vegetation with that. So fire is indeed critical. Um, how, how much do you burn, when you burn? Um, those, kind of, those are all good questions. I'm not sure if I can answer any of those questions in, in this room today. I would probably reserve those questions to a site visit after I had time to talk to you and evaluate your property. So I'm kind of giving you some rule of thumbs about burning. Um, here's an example where um, this road here was used to delineate uh, these, actually this is the same stand. It's just this road was used to, to divide this stand into different burn units. Now we said that nesting habitat and brooder habitat is slightly different. They're really two different habitats. And we know that nesting habitat and brooder habitat needs to be in close proximity to one another. Okay, so developing, if you've got a large, large uh, pine dominated forest, it may be a good idea to divide that forest into different burn units where you burn uh, maybe one side of the road in one year and the, uh, the other side of the road in, in, in another year. There's, uh, now this, this will, what I'm about to tell you will vary too, but there's, there's a lot of evidence in, in the southern coastal plain, uh, pine forest uh, and thin pine forest, where uh, a hen with poles will select a thin pine stand um, uh, for brood breeding one to two years post burn. And she'll select a thin pine stand, a hen will select a thin pine stand two to three years post burn for nesting. So you see there's some, um, they're, they're slightly different. Now, that's just a rule of thumb. It's not gonna apply it everywhere and under every conditions, but, but, uh, but to create those habitats and create them in close proximity to one another, this would be a good, good approach. Um, again, I, I can't really tell you in this room today how often the bird what time of year it burned. I just, I can tell you without doubt, inarguably, that fire is critical. Um, um, I've had to reserve more specifics to, to a site visit to evaluate the current, the current conditions of a site, your, your early go and so forth. But, but I'm often asked about uh, uh, timing to burn, when, when to burn. And for whatever reason, uh, folks tend to lock, get locked into the months of February and March for burning. I'm not quite sure why that is. I would suggest to you throw that out the window. Don't think of um, months um, when to apply fire. Think of conditions. Uh, I don't like to use months when I'm recommending burn. I recommend certain conditions to burn under to accomplish a particular habitat goal. Um, Ted DeVos, who you're going to hear speak a little later, he probably knows that as well as anybody. He burns 12 months out of the year. Uh, and that's the reason I like Ted so much. He's a pyromaniac. He uh, burns himself every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. You should have seen his hair a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Nothing will stop Ted from applying fire. But, but here's, here's a case where uh, this is a loblolly pine stand. This particular landowner has a strong interest in turkeys. And he had this woody problem. This is all, all this woody stuff you see here is, uh, is sweet gums. Um, we thought we could probably uh, set that back with the warm season fire. We were going to try that first before we apply herbicide. This actually was burned in the month of May. And uh, I went back, I forget uh, how long after the burn, to evaluate to see the effects of the fire. I wanted to see if we're, how much re-sprouting, if any, we were getting from these sweet gums, and what kind of herbaceous community we were getting back, you know, post-burn. Well, I was surprised uh, to, to see that we're getting very, very re-sprouting on these, these gum saplings. And I stood right here by this tree, uh, and I counted, I think it was about 11 or 12 different species of herbaceous plants. Um, that pretty much covered all the plant forms. There were woody vines, there were 
for uh, forbs, weedy plants, there were grasses, there were leguminous plants in there. So this, this, this stand here is well on its way of being really good turkey habitat. Another fire or two would probably clean up all this, uh, uh, this dead gum stuff would be really, really, open, really nice. But if we apply fire to summer, we may burn up the nest or two, right? Well, uh, we may, and, and, and that is a big concern among <coughs> landowners. But if I am recommending a summer burn, it's usually to um, reduce the occurrence of wood invasion and shift that ground cover to one that's more herbaceous in nature. If that's, if that's the conditions, we probably have very few, if any, turkey nest in that pine stand. So I'm not really um, worried about burning turkey nest. If I do, that's okay because the enhancing a stand like this, the, the improvements that we get with a, with, with a growing season bird are these kind of conditions far outweigh any, any nest that, that we may burn up. As you heard from Patrick earlier, turkeys have a high reproductive potential and they can um, usually recover from something like this. But, but uh, a fire in the summer to enhance <coughs> habitat conditions um, is, is, is far better than, than the one or two nests that, that we may burn. What, what about trying for timing of, of, say, August, September, October as your growing season? Wouldn't you get the same effect and, and have less chance of destroying some nests? Not only for turkey, but other species. Well, you may, but 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 um, if I, I hate to, I would hate to restrict myself to a month, because even within a month, you don't always have. I mean, how many times? Even if, if I say I'm gonna burn in, in in a particular month, I may only have a few days within that month window to 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 burn. So I, I would not restrict myself to to that. Mm -hmm. And this was a June bird, by the way. Sometimes we may want to um, use a combination of herbicide and fire to reduce the woody competition in the pine stand. We, it may be necessary, or may, um, uh, sometimes it can take longer if you're using a combination of growing and season fires and cool season fires to reclaim uh, an understore. We could probably do it much faster with herbicide and fire. And, but, and, and there may be conditions where we'll have to. We can't fire long, won't do it. Um, here's an open lava like pine stand where we applied, I think it was 16 ounces per acre of a here in, in late summer, and we followed that up with, with a cool season fire. As you can see, the herbicide did a good job of killing all this. Um, sweet gum, oats, and red maple, and stuff like that. Before, before the herbicide fire treatments, um, you didn't see all this succulent green vegetation on the ground. Um, this was pretty much a solid canopy, about chest head high of, of hardwood seedlings with pretty much nothing on the ground. Pretty poor quality turkey habitat. Now, it's good, good turkey habitat. So um, sometimes you may want to choose or may have to choose a combination of herbicide and fire to reclaim that uh, woody evasion and shift that plant community to one that's more favorable for turkeys. Um, um, openings are, are, um, um, are important for turkeys. Uh, there seems to be a very strong preference for openings, uh, particularly during the spring and summer months, you heard uh, Patrick mention that earlier, more so than fall and winter. Um, um, openings, if, if they're managed with turkeys in mind, can produce a super abundant food resources uh, in the way of insects for checks, uh, succulent vegetation, soft mat, seed, um, etc. Et so. Um, Openings can, can, can be and in, in, in are important for, for turkeys. Well, where do we, where do we create openings? Where do, where do we start creating openings? Well, some of, some of you landowners may have 
uh, an interest in generating revenue from your pine plantations. That may be your priority. But you also have an interest in hunting turkeys. Uh, if you got a, uh, a stand that looks like this, um, before you plant it, you could probably um, open up those road sites to look like that in a young plantation. Uh, as you can see, now this one was just recently created, or was recently created when I took this picture. So the ground cover isn't well developed yet, we still see bare ground from the dozier put. But here you have a road that's uh, crowned, stays dry, so you've got this big opening in, in the canopy there. You allow a lot of sunlight and wind to reach the road, so drying out time is much quicker. You keep your road intact longer. Uh, you've got uh, this uh, space that was created between the plantation and the road that once the vegetation develops, be really good turkey habitat. And also, these wide roadsides provide links to different habitat types. Uh, you probably wouldn't want your turkeys <coughs> traveling through this dense pine plantation. Um, 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 they'd probably be more likely to get eaten by a predator if they were forced to travel through that dense stand to get back here. So by opening this, this, uh, these road signs you provide a safe link or travel corridor for turkey to get from one habitat type to, to another. So you can, you can open up the road sides on the front end of a plantation. Or like this landowner down in Crenshaw County who uh, they decided that you know, he has an interest in turkeys. Obviously he has an interest in generating revenue from the timber resource. That should be pretty obvious. Uh, so he calls me down and says, you know, I think I want to improve my pine plantations for, for turkeys. What, what do I do? So before he thinned this, we plan for him to incorporate some turkey considerations in his pine plantation. As you can see, I think we took off two rows, I think it was, uh, on the side of the road. To open up that road, you can see this road kind of sitting down. It's up right here, so you know where all the water's coming. So we wanted to open this, this road up, knowing it's going to get wet, to dry it out. Once the ground cover uh, um, recovers along these roadsides. You'll have a lot of vegetation growing along here. Uh, we actually, you can't see it in this shot, but we actually created a network of wide fire breaks, roadsides, logging decks, food plots throughout that whole pine plantation. I wish I had an aerial view of this. You could, you could really get a better view of what's going on here. Um, and um, now that this pine stand is standing, it will, it will, be, uh, it will be prescribed burn. Here's, here's a roadside habitat that's already developed. Landowner I, I was working with down in uh, Washington County. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, this landowner has six miles of this roadside habitat. Six miles. And um, one of few properties that when I'm, when I'm traveling these roads that you have to break for turkeys. I suggested that he put some road signs on, uh, you know, break for turkeys or turkey crossing, something like that. And as you can see, there's a lot of young turkeys. You can't see them all. A lot of them ran out in here before I can get the picture of them, but there are a lot of, a lot of young turkeys that are foraging in this roadside habitat right there. And again, that's, he's got six miles of this stuff here. Most of it is managed in native uh, vegetation like this. There are certain stretches along the road that we are planting brown top millet, primarily in areas that are wet, that we're not getting the kind of plant community that we want for turkeys, but it will grow a summer food plot real well. But the vast majority of the six miles is in native, native habitat like this. And uh, it's disturbed, I think, uh, on, on a two year return interval, I think. Not the whole six miles, but uh, when you see the road here, this side may be disturbed in year one, and this side of the road, the left fallow, next year would we'll disturb this side and leave that fallow. So when you're developing a, a, a maintenance plan, um, um, you know, six miles of roadside, both sides, that's a lot of maintenance work to do, but when you're, when you're dividing your maintenance into uh, half or thirds, that cuts your 
maintenance time down the road, while at the same time meeting the habitat requirements of turtles. <coughs> Fire breaks. Uh, if we got pine plantations, certainly we'll, we're going to want to burn them if we have an interest in turkeys. Um, I'm very partial to wide fire breaks. I'm really not a big fan of just a single plow line and that separates two different um, forest communities. It's kind of hard to, if you like to burn, you know, it's, I don't want to be working off something like, you know, just like that if I'm burning. I want plenty of space so I can get equipment down. If the fire jumps a line down the way, I can get there pretty quickly. So. From a, from a management standpoint, a wide fire break is probably advantageous. And you see here, here's a young plantation that hasn't been thin yet. Here's a lot of plantation that's already been thin. Here's this plowed line to retain the fire in this stand. Here's this road, and here's, here's this food plot for turkeys that's being undisturbed. You don't have to plant all your fire, fire lanes. In fact, I would suggest that you, that you don't. It costs a lot more money to plant fire breaks than it is to simply maintain them by likely biscuit or mowing. So, um, if I can accomplish my turkey habitat goals with less investment, I'm certainly going to take that option. But you can plant some of them, a portion of them. They're highly attractive to turkeys in the spring when you're out hunting. Um, but uh, here's uh, here's a pine plantation over in Dallas County where. This landowner has an interest in turkeys. Uh, uh, we simply maintain this by lightly biscuit every couple of years. This stand here is, is burned every three years. Um, again, wide fire break, get some sun in here, get some plants growing on it. Turkeys love to use it. Plenty of space to do, to, to do management as well. Uh, beetle spots, I showed you this slide uh, earlier. Uh, beetle spots are, are, tend to be overlooked in turkey habitat management plans. They're easy spots to grab, roughly easy spots to grab to do management work in. Uh, this one is pretty close to uh, a secondary road. Um, so it's, uh, it was uh, no problem to get uh, 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 ATV in there with spraying equipment to spray the woody invasion and, and keep it keep it mowed. Uh, because this is a beetle spot, we're getting more sunlight to the ground than we are in the interior part of the pine stand. The plant growth is is generally uh, faster than the plant growth in the forest interior. So we do have to mow this occasionally. But because we use fire, um, fire cleans up all the fats that we create when we mow it. Um, there are probably going to be a lot of beetle spots out there here pretty soon. This winter I work with a lot of landowners down in the southeast and west part of the state that are just beetles are just chomping away at their timber. So if you're one of those, you may want to consider taking advantage of those and, and, and provide some turkey habitat there. Uh, loading decks is, is another relatively easy place that we can provide some turkey habitat. Uh, after a timber harvest, um, a lot of these uh, loading decks are uh, left to grow up in sweet gum, Chinese privet, or even loblight pine seedlings, and um, um, and uh, uh, doesn't cost a whole lot to maintain them for turkeys. Um, this is the land I was working with down in uh, Wilcox County. Uh, we had I don't know how many how many. Um, loading decks that he had, but it was a bunch of them. And uh, we took an aerial photograph and I then located all those logging decks on an aerial photo and I developed a, a maintenance plan for them. And they went in and reclaimed almost all of those loading decks. And uh, some of them were being planted in, in food plots, some of them were being maintained with periodic mowing. Um, and, um, Just, again, they're there. Uh, um, you don't really have to create them. They're, they're created for you during a timber harvest. You just clean them up afterwards and, and, and maintain them uh, uh, after that. 
like uh, fire breaks, you don't have to plan all your loading decks. Uh, in fact, I suggest you know you you, you don't. Um, this is one here that uh, um, that's being maintained in, in um, uh, natural vegetation. This is another good shot of root habitat. Chicks can get in here and forage beneath that canopy of weeds. Hand can see over it. Got thick cover all the way around it in case a in case a hawk flies over. But you can plant them. Um, they're certainly fun to places to hunt turkeys in the spring, so might as well plant you a few of them. But I would suggest if you were going to clean off a logging deck and plant them, you may want to remove all this logging tree right here. Um, pretty, it's it's pretty, been a pretty common practice over the years, but what happens is you pile this logging debris up around a logging deck, you restrict turkey access to and from this plot, um, which uh, uh, may encourage uh, turkey predator interaction. You have more predation of turkeys. Also, this stuff right here, once the soil begins to fall out of it, it makes really good den sites for raccoons, skunks, um, foxes, bobcats, all those uh, predators that feed on turkeys. You don't want to encourage predator habitat in the same place that you try to encourage turkey habitat. So, you push one off, whether you plant it or keep it natural, you may want to remove all this, this light and green. So to wrap it up, and, and I'm really in, reiterating what Patrick said earlier, when we're developing a forest management plan for turkeys, we really want to develop a plan that addresses uh, uh, nesting and river and habitats. Um, those are the habitat types are generally the most significant limiting factors on, on property. And I would probably say that nearly every property that I've evaluated for turkeys always been, always been these two habitat types that are limiting populations on those properties. So when you're developing a plan, make sure you develop a plan uh, to, to address. You can't have enough nesting habitat, you can't have enough brooder in habitat. Um, and if your goal is to produce turkeys, not just simply attract one deer turkey, so if you want to produce more turkeys, um, which we're, we've got to, we've got to target those habitats. For you guys who are members of the Alabama Wildlife Federation, you've probably seen these in probably the recent years. Um, Mark Smith, that guy back there on the wall who's developing his PowerPoint presentation, he was a lead author on that. That, uh, that article, so if you disagree with it, talk to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but whether we agree or disagree, that's a fact. So you can't change the fact. But uh, anyway, you can go there and get, get more information. That's, that's all I got. Any questions? I didn't yeah, cough any, one. did I? I have one. <laughs> yeah. One of your early slides, you showed the. Uh, turkey that you maybe had run off the roof, I mean off the nest. Mm -hmm. Did she go back? She went back. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm just she was back. In fact, once I, once I, when I, when I jumped her off the nest there, I took the picture and I left. And, and she, she was seen in there. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you. space that was created between the plantation and the road that once the vegetation develops be really good turkey habitat. And also these wide roadsides provide links to different habitat types. Uh, you probably wouldn't want your turkeys <coughs> traveling through this dense pine plantation. Um, 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 they'd probably be more likely to get eaten by a predator if they were forced to travel through that dense stand to get back here. So by opening this this uh, 
these roadsides you provide a safe link or travel corridor for turkeys to get from one habitat type to, to another. So you can you can open up the roadsides on the front end of a plantation, or like this landowner down in Crenshaw County who uh, they decided that you know he has an interest in turkeys. Obviously, he has an interest in generating revenue from the timber resource. That should be pretty obvious. Uh, so he calls me down and says, you know, I think I want to improve my pine plantations for for turkeys. What what do I do? So before he thin this, we plan for him to incorporate some turkey considerations in his pine plantation. As you can see, I think we took off two rows, I think it was, uh, on the side of the road. To open up that road, you can see this road kind of sitting down. It's up right here, so you know where all the water's coming. So we wanted to open this, this road up, knowing it's going to get wet, to dry it out. Once the ground cover uh, um, recovers along these roadsides. It'll have a lot of vegetation growing along here. Uh, we actually, you can't see it in this shot, but we actually created a network of wide fire breaks, roadsides, logging decks, food plots throughout the whole pine plantation. I wish I had an aerial view of this. You could, you could really get a better view of what's going on here. Um, and um, now that this pine stand is standing, it will, it will, be, uh, it will be prescribed burned. Here's, here's a roadside habitat that's already developed. Landowner I, I was working with down in um, Washington County. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, this landowner has six miles of this roadside habitat. Six miles. And um, one of the few properties that when I'm, when I'm traveling these roads that you have to break for turkeys. I suggested that he put some road signs on, uh, you know, break for turkeys or turkey crossing, something like that. And as you can see, there's a lot of young turkeys. You can't see them all. There are a lot of them ran out in here before I can get the picture of them, but there are a lot of, a lot of young turkeys that are foraging in this roadside habitat right there. And again, that's, he's got six miles of this stuff here. Most of it is managed in native uh, vegetation like this. There are certain stretches along the road that we are planting brown top millet, primarily in areas that are wet, that we're not getting the kind of plant community that we want for turkeys, but it will grow a summer food plot real well. But the vast majority of the six miles is in native, native habitat like this. And uh, it's disturbed, I think, uh, uh, on a two-year return interval, I think. Not the whole six miles. But uh, well, you see the road here, this side may be disturbed in year one, and this side of the road left fallow next year would disturb this side and, and leave that fallow. So when you're developing a, a, a maintenance plan, um, um, you know, six miles of roadside, both sides, that's a lot of maintenance work to do. But when you're, when you're dividing your maintenance into uh, half or thirds, that cuts your, your maintenance time down while at the same time meeting the habitat requirements for turkeys. <coughs> Fire breaks. Uh, if we got pine plantations, certainly we're going to want to burn them if we have an interest in turkeys. Um, I'm very partial to wide fire breaks. I'm really not a big fan of just a single plow line that separates two different um, forest communities. It's kind of hard to, if you like to burn, you know it's I don't want to be working off something like, you know, just like that if I'm burning. I want plenty of space so I can get equipment down. If the fire jumps a line down the way, I can get there pretty quickly. So from a, from a management standpoint, a wide fire break is probably in the pages. And you see here, here's a young plantation that hasn't been thin yet. Here's a lot of plantation that's already been thin. Here's this plowed line to retain the fire in this stand. Here's this road. And here's, here's this food plot for turkeys that's being undisturbed. You don't have to plant all your fire, fire lanes. In fact, I would suggest that you, that you don't. It costs a lot more money to plant fire breaks than it is to simply maintain them by likely biscuit or mowing. So um, if I can accomplish my turkey habitat goals with less investment, 
I'm certainly going to take that option. But you can plant some of them, a portion of them. They're highly attractive to turkeys in the spring when you're out hunting. Um, but uh, here's, uh, here's a pine plantation over in Dallas County where this landowner has an interest in turkeys. Uh, um, we simply maintain this by lightly disking every couple of years. This stand here is, is, is burned every three years. Um, again, wide fire break, get some sun in here, get some plants growing on it. Turkeys love to use it. Plenty of space to do, to, to do management as well. Uh, beetle spots, I showed you this slide uh, earlier. Uh, beetle spots. Are, are tend to be overlooked in turkey habitat management plans. They're easy spots to grab, roughly easy spots to grab to do management work in. Uh, this one is pretty close to um, a secondary road, um, so it's uh, it was uh, no problem to get uh, uh, an ATV in there with spraying equipment to spray the woody invasion and. And you keep it keep it mowed pretty high. <laughs> because this is a beetle spot, we're getting more sunlight to the ground than we are in the interior part of the pine stand. The plant growth is is generally uh, faster than the plant growth in the forest interior. So we do have to mow this occasionally. But because we use fire, um, fire cleans up all the fats that we create when we mow it. Um, there are probably gonna be a lot of beetle spots out there here pretty soon. This winter, I worked with a lot of landowners down in the southeast and west part of the state that are just beetles are just chomping away at their timber. So, if you're one of those, you may want to consider taking advantage of those and, and, and provide some turkey habitat there. Uh, loading decks is, is another relatively easy place that we can provide some turkey habitat. Uh, after a timber harvest, um, a lot of these. Uh, loading decks are uh, left to grow up in sweet gum, Chinese privet, or even a lot of light pine seedlings. And, um, um, and uh, doesn't cost a whole lot to maintain them for turkeys. Um, this is the landowner's working with in uh, Wilcox County. Uh, you have, I don't know how many, how many um, loading decks that he had, but it was a bunch of them. And, uh, we took an aerial photograph and I located all those logging decks on an aerial photo and I developed a, a maintenance plan for them and they went in and reclaimed almost all of those loading decks. And uh, some of them are being planted in, in food plots, some of them are being maintained with periodic mowing. Um, and, um, um, uh, and just again, they're there. Um, you don't really have to create them. They're, they're created for you during a timber harvest. You just clean them up afterwards and, and, and maintain them uh, uh, after that. Like uh, fire breaks, you don't have to plant all your loading decks. Uh, in fact, I suggest you know you, you, you don't. Um, this is one here that uh, um, that's being maintained and and. Um, uh, natural vegetation. This is another good shot of brood habitat. Chicks can get in here and forage beneath that canopy of weeds, can and see over it. Got thick cover all the way around in case a, in case a hawk flies over. But you can plant them. Um, they're certainly fun to places to hunt turkeys in the spring, so might as well plant you a few of them. But I would suggest if you were going to clean off a lot of your deck and plant them, you may want to remove all this logging right here. Um, pretty, it's it's pretty, been a pretty common practice over the years, but what happens is you pile this logging debris up around a logging deck, you restrict turkey access to and from this plot, um, which uh, uh, may encourage uh, turkey predator interaction. You have more predation of turkeys. Also, this stuff right here, once the soil begins to fall out of it, makes really good den sites for raccoons, skunks, um, foxes, bobcats, all those uh, predators that feed on turkeys. You don't want to encourage predator habitat in the same place that you're trying to encourage turkey habitat. So you put
push one off, we're going to plant it or keep it natural, and then we'll remove all this, this light. So to wrap it up, and, and I'm really in, reiterating what Patrick said earlier, when we're developing a forest management plan for turkeys, we really want to develop a plan that addresses uh, uh, nesting and breeding and habitats. Um, those are the habitat types are generally the most significant limiting factors on, on property. And I would probably say that nearly every property that I've evaluated for turkeys always been always been these two habitat types that are limiting populations on those properties. So when you're developing a plan, make sure you develop a plan uh, to, to address. You can't have enough nesting habitat, you can't have enough brood breeding habitat. Um, and if your goal is to produce turkeys, not just simply attract one deer turkey, so you want to produce more turkeys, um, we've, we've got to we've got to target those habitats.